but I'll, I'll do that on a pretty regular basis on Sunday mornings. And a song came through my list that had lyrics to this effect, It is good for us to be here, praise the Lord. And it is good to sing His praises, praise the Lord. And I couldn't help but, but go ahead and project myself to this moment when we are together. It is indeed good to be here together. Did you bring your Bibles this morning? Hold them up, please. Let me see. Let me see. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we are people of God's Word. We strive. We strive to be in it every day. We want to know what God's will is for us, and we believe that this book has been preserved for us by God's mighty hand throughout all of these centuries so that we can know what it is He wants us to do with our lives, so that we can know how we are to obediently respond to what He has done for us. We are in the third lesson of a series we have entitled The True Gospel. And I, I want to begin this morning by thanking you for the way that you have responded to these lessons, both from your encouraging words, but also from your questions and your critiques. Now, that may sound a little strange coming from the preacher. I think some people uh, sometimes believe preachers don't want to hear critiques, but that's not true. I take the presentation of God's Word very seriously. And I am constantly learning how to better understand the Scriptures. Constantly learning how to better articulate the concepts and, and the ideas that have been preserved for us in the Bible. And your input about what comes across well and what doesn't come across well well, what resonates and what doesn't resonate, that, that helps me to develop and, and become better at sharing the Word of God with people. And so I want to thank you for the way you've responded and the feedback you've given. But with, with that being said, there are a couple of things I, I need to clarify this morning as we press on in this study. Two weeks ago, in defining the gospel... And in defining the message of the gospel, I, I used the phrasing that through the gospel we can be as righteous as God is. And it has come to my attention that this particular phrasing has, has actually caused some confusion and did not properly convey what I intended for it to convey. And so I want to take a moment and at least rephrase that to better convey the idea. What, what I was trying to convey to you on that day is that when the Bible tells us that God's righteousness has been made available, it means that God makes us completely righteous by grace, through faith, apart from works of law. And as we have continued to discuss that this righteousness does not come by works of law, or as we have also rephrased it, it does not come by performing good enough. I, let, let me also make sure that, that you understand a couple of other things in case there are questions about this. I am not saying that there is no action required on our part in order to receive this righteousness from God. I believe, and you know that I believe, and you've heard me teach consistently for four years now, that we receive our righteousness when we repent of our sins, when we confess that Jesus is Lord of our lives, and when we are baptized into Christ for the purpose of receiving the forgiveness of our sins. And that was one of the primary focuses of the series, Faith of the Ages, that we did at the end of last year. I am saying that those actions that God looks for and requires on our part, I am saying that those actions are a part of our faith as opposed to a list of works by which we earn our righteousness. And I also want to make sure that I state clearly that I do believe that the Bible teaches you can sin, you can sin in such a way as to lose this righteousness from God. Passages like Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, 1 through 4, Hebrews 6, 1 through 8, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 17 through 22. These and others clearly teach that God will revoke His righteousness from the person who turns their back on Him. And so I wanted to lay all these things out in case there, there has been confusion in your mind about it. 
And, and so hopefully we, we, can, we can press on in this study. We are seeking right now, we are seeking to understand the difference between the pursuit of law righteousness versus faith righteousness. The Bible says there are two ways that a person can be right before God. One by pursuing law and one by grace through faith. And I'm going to ask you again to hang with me from, from week to week through this series uh, because it's, we're going to be connecting concepts together. This is one of those deep studies that you can't get it all out in one or two lessons. So I'm, I'm asking you to hang with me as we press forward. And I, I will make a promise to you about this. Right now, we are focused almost exclusively on law righteousness and the pursuit of it. But I will make you a promise that here in a couple of weeks, we're going to flip this coin over. And we're going to look at what it means to pursue faith righteousness. What does it mean to be saved by grace through faith? For now, if you will allow me, let, let's keep this at a summary statement until we get to that point. Faith righteousness means that God imputes or credits righteousness to us as a gift when He sees our obedient faith. Contrast to that, law righteousness. Law righteousness is earned. It is a system by which, or it is a system based upon performing the rules well enough in order to get to heaven. Having done enough to get yourself to heaven. Thus, last week we defined legalism as being any effort to gain righteousness in part or in whole through works of law. We also discussed the fallacy of trying to join together, blend together a faith system to a law or performance system. If for nothing else, the reason why you cannot, why you do not blend them together is because theologically it's not possible. If you were to look at Romans chapter 11, verse 6, Paul writes there in that verse, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. And if you happen to be reading from a New King James or King James, you'll notice that, that the text continues just to, uh, with, another, with another sentence. Where he said, whereas he says that otherwise grace would no longer be grace, but if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. As we study to, to put together our understanding of what God wants us to do, we have to make a choice regarding our salvation. Because church, what he said in, in Romans eleven six 6 is, you are either saved by grace or you're saved by your works. You are either saved as a gift of righteousness from God or you are saved based upon how well you perform. It is, it is either or, not both and. It can't be both. And so we have a choice to make as to which one of these we're going to pursue. Which method of righteousness are we going to seek to possess? There are numerous reasons why we do not want to appeal to law, to a law system for our righteousness. Today I would like for us to take, a, take note of and take a look at six doctrinal consequences of appealing to law, of appealing to our own performance as what would get us to heaven. If you would, I want to begin in Romans chapter 10, our scripture reading that we had this morning. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. As uh, we, we take a look at, at what Paul, Paul is speaking concerning uh, his, his feelings and his thoughts about Israel, the nation of Israel, his Jewish brothers. He says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, for Israel, is that they may be saved. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ 
is the end of law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The first consequence that we will face if we seek to appeal to law for our righteousness is that we reject God's righteousness. Notice that's what he said Israel was guilty of doing. They were seeking to establish their own righteousness instead of submitting to God's. Thus they were rejecting the Lord's. Pursuing law righteousness means that you spend your life trying to be righteous yourself. And that is going to be the basis for which you will be judged how well you did. And the thing is, is that most of our world exists with this understanding. Most people that we will come in contact with believe that they're going to get to heaven if they've been good enough. And what they don't understand is that God has provided an alternative. And that belief, that understanding that there's only one way, that the only way you're going to get there is if, you, is if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds... That has led a lot of people to look at Christianity, to look at the gospel, to look at faith and say, well, you know, I, I just can't live it. I just can't do it. I, I can't live that. To which I would say exactly. You can't live it. That's what law should teach you. That you cannot live it. If by living it you mean living good enough to go to heaven. You can't live it. I can't live it. None of us can live good enough to get there. And when you appeal to law, you are appealing to your own works. And you will stand before God on judgment day and try to convince Him that you did more good than you did bad. But as we're going to find out in a minute it's not going to be good enough. And so the first consequence of appealing to law is that you reject God's righteousness by seeking to establish your own righteousness. Closely related to that, I, would, I want to ask you to turn with me to the book of Galatians now. Closely related to rejecting God's righteousness, we find that in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21... Paul makes the statement, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if justification were through law, then Christ died, to no pur Christ died for no purpose. Here what we find is that if we seek to appeal to law for our righteousness as the source of our righteousness, we set aside God's grace. Most of the versions that you're reading from will probably say that I do not set aside God's grace. The English standard uses the word nullify that I nullify the grace of God. The word means, whether it's translated set aside or nullify, the definition of the term means to put as of no value. To put as of no value. Consider then, consider then, that to appeal to law righteousness, to appeal to your own ability to keep the rules well enough, is to place no value on the grace of God. Church, I don't want to set aside the grace of God. I don't want to nullify it. I need God's grace. I need all of it. Because I know that I can't get there on my own. And yet, when I appeal to my performance when I am determining that I'm going to do enough to get me into the pearly gates, whether I actually use these words or not, by appealing to my own performance, I am effectively saying that I place a higher value on my own ability to do good than I do on God's gift of grace. And so one of the consequences of appealing to law for our righteousness is that we set aside the grace of God. A third consequence comes in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1-4, through 4, that you have fallen from grace. Turn with me and let's read those verses. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 5, Paul says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, 
I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man that accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You can't pick and choose just which rules you want or you can't pick and choose which law you want to use as your performance metric. If you're going to rely on law, you've got to rely on all of it. We're going to talk about that a little bit more here in just a second. But notice what he says going into verse 4 then. You are obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by law, you have fallen away from grace. I want to suggest to you something, and and just ponder this here for a minute. I I want to suggest to you that that this passage is, is a good example of how our theology concerning law and grace can influence the way that we interpret passages. And we've, we talked for a couple of weeks that, that most of the time in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament particularly, when we see the term the law, our minds immediately go to, to Mosaic law. In many contexts, he is talking about Mosaic law. But when it comes to application, we keep it exclusively about Mosaic law. Thus winding up saying, well, the, 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 there, there's no real practical application for me because I was never under Mosaic law. And yet, in Romans chapter 2, verse 14, with his statement about Gentiles not having the law, yet doing the things that are in the law, they become a law to themselves. In that verse, Paul broadens the application of law righteousness to include Mosaic law, but also to include any law that a man might use to make himself right before God. And so with regards to how we are made right before God, whatever is true about the law of Moses is going to be true about any law that a man may choose. But when we say, when when we typically say that that someone has fallen from grace, what what are we usually usually saying that they have done? What, what What are we thinking has caused their fall? Typically we we think in our minds that that they've become wrapped up in some sort of sin or unfaithfulness or immorality that has caused them to fall from grace. And and understand, those are great intentions. Those are great things that we need to try to steer one another away from because we don't want to see that happen. But according to the Bible, that's not how you fall from grace. According to this, to this passage, the way that you fall from grace is when you return to law as your source of justification. Read the first part of verse 4 again. To whom is this statement addressed? He is speaking to those who are relying on law for their righteousness. What were they doing? They were going back to law. So when they fell away from grace, what did they fall back into? They fell back into works of law because that was the only option. Remember, you are either saved by grace or you're saved by law. And so if you stop relying on grace to make you righteous, what's the only alternative? Your own works. Your own self-made righteousness. Now again, that... Are are we saying now that that God is okay with an immoral lifestyle and a rebellious lifestyle when somebody becomes a Christian? No, we're not saying that at all. Please don't walk away thinking that that's what Corey just meant. There are plenty of other passages that demonstrate God does not accept an immoral and rebellious lifestyle from Christians. But this passage has a specific context and it has a specific point. That if you go back to relying on law as your source of righteousness, you are severing yourself from Christ because you are falling away from grace. But a fourth consequence that comes by appealing to law for our righteousness is that we put ourselves under a curse. And that curse is that perfect obedience is required. Look at chapter 3. Verse 10 of Galatians, he says, For all who rely on works of law are under a curse. 
For it is written, Cursed to be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Your operative phrases there are all things and do them. I would ask you again, like we did in the last point, to whom is this verse being directed? All who rely on works of law. So if you choose to appeal to law for your righteousness, on judgment day, as you stand before God to plead your case, you are going to have to stand before Him having lived a perfect life. You cannot have made one single mistake. Now in my judgment, that's pretty good information to have. That's pretty good information to have if you're going to appeal to law, if you're going to try to convince God that you did more good than bad. And, and, and you know what, just for argument, what, what if you could prove that? What if you could prove that? That, that, that you did more good than you did bad? A lot of people in our world, they, they think that God's going to have the balance scale out when they stand before Him on Judgment Day. And, and on this side is going to be all your good deeds, and on this side is going to be all of your bad deeds. And, and a lot of people think that as long as my good deeds outweigh my bad, then I'm going to be in good shape. I'm going to be able to get into heaven. And so what if you could demonstrate that? What if you could show God that in your lifetime you had 95% good works and only 5% bad? What, what if you could show that you were 99% good works and only 1% bad? Well, according to Galatians 3.10... You're still out of luck at that point. According to Galatians 3.10, if you have 99% good works and 1% bad, you don't get into heaven. Because there cannot be one single sin sitting over here in this tray. James will say in James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. And so church, understand something, that only 100% perfection will get you into heaven if you choose to appeal to your performance for your righteousness. You've got to do it all, and you've got to do it all the time. Law does not care what you did yesterday. It only cares what you're doing for me right here, right now. And so when we appeal to law for our righteousness, we put ourselves under a curse. Fifthly, if we appeal to law as our source of righteousness, we are trying to use law to accomplish something it was never intended to accomplish. Look at chapter 3, verse 21. Paul writes, Is law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life then righteousness would indeed be by law. Notice what he says in 321. Law cannot give you life. By its very nature, law cannot restore life to a broken soul. Once you cross law, the only thing law can do is show you how much you've, you've broken the rules. Law can only convict you of sin once you've crossed it. It cannot restore life. And Paul will say in this verse that if God could have saved us by a system of law, if He could have accomplished that, then He would have done that. He certainly would, have, would not have sent His Son to die on the cross if He could have given us a list of rules that would have saved us. But you see, here's the thing. God, when God sent Jesus to die, He was not only showing His concern for you and me, He was providing the only way that man could possibly be saved. That God becomes man. He lives a perfect life that He had to live, and He died on the cross as payment for my sins. And it's not a situation. I, I think some people have, have occasionally developed the thought that, that when you look at 
when you look at old law versus New Testament law, some people have said, well, he didn't do a good enough job on the first one, and so he's going to get it right the second time. That's not what happened. Nor is it correct to say that the Jews were saved by their law, and we Christians are saved by our law. That's not, that's not correct either. To, to look into either one of those to those perspectives is to miss the point altogether. The point is, law cannot save you. And if we are seeking, and if we are seeking to appeal to law as the source of our righteousness, then we are trying to use law for something it was never intended to accomplish. But finally, if we seek to appeal to a performance-based righteousness, to appeal to law, then we kill our faith. Look at chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Paul begins, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by law, for the righteous shall live by faith. You may have a footnote in your Bible that says that particular Greek phrase can also be translated, the one who by faith is righteous will live. He will go on to say in verse 12 that however, law is not of faith. Law is not based on faith because the one who does them shall live by them. You can keep law. You can keep law and not trust in anybody. You can obey rules and have no love or trust in the rule giver. That's possible. And in fact, if you're going to keep law for your righteousness, the truth of the matter is that you pretty much have to trust in yourself. Because who else are you going to rely on? If your righteousness is dependent upon you being good enough, who else are you going to trust with that? You have to trust yourself if this is your means of being righteous. And next week, next time when we come back, it'll actually be a couple of weeks, next time we're going to take a look at some of the practical consequences that come when we appeal to law, when we appeal to our performance for our righteousness. This kind of approach to, to salvation affects our personality. It affects the way that we interact with people. And we're going to see what some of those consequences are. But he says that law is not based on faith. Keeping law is not based on faith. You know, we have defined and studied out pretty extensively that to have faith means that you have a trust in God that results in an obedient response to what He has revealed. But if you're trusting in yourself to be good enough, then you're not really trusting in God. And when you appeal to law for your righteousness, then you kill your faith. I have often found it the case that when I, come, when I come to an understanding of some truth in God's Word that I didn't understand before, as I continue to read and study, it's amazing to me to find how many places the Bible will say that very same truth that just came to my understanding. It's kind of like when you buy a new car. You know, before you had that car, you never saw it anywhere, but once you're riding around in it, that's the only car you see on the road anymore. You see it all over the place. And I think to myself in those times, how, how did I miss this? How, how did I read right over the top of this and, and this never really hit my brain, hit my heart? I think it's because... I think it's because when we come to the Scriptures, we, all have, we are all at a certain place in our understanding we have an understanding of principles that we've studied out for a long time and, and that we've worked our way through. And the thing about it is that when we open up passages, we will filter that passage through our current understanding of the Scriptures. And sometimes, 
Sometimes, occasionally, that may mean that, that some pretty plain teaching just kind of slips over our head. I know at one point in my life, what we're talking about here fit into that category. And it may be possible that some of what we're talking about could be in that category for others here. It may not be. This may not be anything new to you, and God bless you if it's not. But if it is something that is new understanding, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you've not been a Christian all these years. It doesn't mean that all of your previous teaching was wrong and that it was, and that it was misplaced. It doesn't mean that all the previous teachers that we loved were teaching error. It's not that at all. That's, that's not what we're saying. But it may mean that, that our understanding of the nature of the gospel is growing. And as our understanding of the gospel message grows, hopefully our eyes are being opened to the great security that we have possessed all along, but yet some of us may just not have fully realized what God had already given us. I don't know. I don't know. But here's what I do know. I do know that I will never be able to perform well enough to go to heaven. You will never be able to perform well enough to go to heaven. And that's why we need the blood of Jesus to make us righteous before God. We need the blood of Jesus to cleanse the sin that I cannot cleanse on my own by working harder and harder to try to overcome my own deficiencies. And this morning, as we wrap this up, you have an opportunity to access this cleansing blood of Jesus by obeying the gospel. By coming and confessing your sins, repenting of your sins, confessing that Jesus is Lord of your life, and submitting to Him in the waters of baptism. And as you rise to walk in newness of life, we understand as well that as we begin that walk in that new life, God expects us to continue to walk in obedient trust. Always, never veering from that path. And if you're here this morning and you have veered from that path of obedient trust, and you need prayers for forgiveness and courage and strength, we want to love you, we want to wrap our arms around you and be to you what God has called this church to be for each other. And so if we can help you in any way, we can help you at all. Please let us know right now while we stand and sing.